Hello, everyone. Uh, this is the uh, nice to I hope everyone's enjoying this, the sessions that they've seen to date. Um, this afternoon, we've got some three really interesting talks. Uh, one from uh, James in, from Confluent talking about data mesh. Uh, the next, the next one from Rana uh, talking about open banking and and the, how to do some successful implementations around that. And then followed closely by Matthias, who's going to be then talking about how to rebuild um, the financial services threats and opportunities of a banking and a service. So on the home stretch now, sit back, enjoy, and. Um, we look forward to introducing our first speaker, James Gotlin, um, Senior Solution Engineer from Confluent. He's going to be talking about data mesh and event streaming, unlocking your data in real time. Hi, James. Hey, David. Thanks for the intro. Hello, everyone. Um, hope you're having a good conference. How nice it is to do uh, one of these live, uh, not recorded. This is great. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, event streaming and data mesh. Um, and this is all about kind of like unlocking data and doing so in real time. So as David said, my name is James Gollum. I'm a senior solutions engineer with Confluent based in Sydney. And uh, the agenda for today uh, is going to be uh, really starting off by looking at a very sort of like high level at what is data mesh and what problem is it solving, all right? Um, then we're going to move through to uh, looking at what is event streaming, uh, <laughs> two, two big things in this talk. Uh, and then finally, how do these two things relate? Like, how do we actually bring these together to deliver on uh, some kind of business outcome? Um, so that's the idea. Um, I think uh, I have 25 minutes, so it may be uh, ambitious what I'm planning, but uh, we'll see how we go. So, um, so data mesh. As a concept, many of you may have heard of it. Uh, it was kind of introduced in 2019 through, um, through ThoughtWorks. Uh, Jamek Dagani uh, at ThoughtWorks came up with this idea. Uh, important to understand, it's an implementation pattern. It's an approach. Um, and this approach has four key principles. Um, it's technology agnostic. And that's kind of important, right? Because the approach and the principles are um, yeah, uh, sit at a level above technology. Um, but disclaimer, I work for Confluent <laughs> and um, Confluent do a lot of event streaming and I have an opinion around the technology. And so what I'm gonna try and do is bring those two things together. Um, and really kind of like the, the main sort of like reason that data mesh uh, came about was to solve a problem with sort of like these failed data projects. And so, ThoughtWorks had a look at um, you know, these, these, these projects and the failure modes in these projects and why they were failing. So big data projects that had very ambitious goals, um, but weren't delivering the business results that were expected. And so the, the kind of the common approach uh, that they were seeing was this idea of kind of like applications um, that uh, were basically backed by some kind of data store and so this was the system of record for the application it was updating the, the data. And uh, actually, we would have kind of like within, within the business, we would have a number of these applications. And so these applications were running and using kind of like uh, using data in their databases. And this kind of like the data, the approach to data um, in these systems was very much operational. Okay, so we were thinking about kind of like operational data. And so that's the a shape of data that makes it possible to build systems uh, to, to execute on, on business logic. Um, and then there was the, the approach to analytics. And the, the general approach was that we had some kind of um, sort of analytic um, data or an analytic data plane. And that really was made up of a number of uh, data products. So this, this may have been kind of like the data lake. Um, and it may have been a, a data warehouse and a combination of these things, potentially a data mart, um, data lake house, all of the different things that sort of like we've, we're, we're sort of like realizing exist in this uh, analytics space. And the approach was to take this operational data and essentially push it into uh, this 
this analytic um, data plane. And so this process uh, typically used a process called ATL, which you may be familiar with, um, sort of this idea of extract, transform, and load. And these pipelines would be built between these various systems. Um, and, and so this approach kind of like uh, introduced this idea of operational data and analytic data being quite separate. And the output from this sort of like analytic space over here uh, tended to be kind of things like uh, reports um, and, you know, visualizations um, and, and often sort of like uh, metrics and, and sort of like dashboards. So um, the kinds of things that you're familiar with coming out of a data analytics space. And so this was kind of like the pattern that's been sort of like uh, being implemented, uh, but the pattern that is kind of failing to deliver on the results. Um, and I suppose uh, data mesh was a sort of like a response to this lack of uh, business value delivery and sort of like uh, trying to figure out a better way of actually approaching this problem. And so one of the key things around this is um, these, this operational data, analytics data, um, it's, it's quite complex, um, but it's also, uh, it's also actually, um, it's, it's quite fragile. These ETL pipelines um, can introduce inconsistencies in data, can be hard to maintain, hard to control. But one of the things that you sort of notice in this pattern is because the data is being shared kind of like across operations and analytics, it's kind of like a question that comes out of this of who's the owner of the data? Is the owner of the data the, the, the application? Is the owner of the data the analytics? Or is it kind of not clear? And so this is uh, one of the problems that sort of like laid, laid, laid the foundations for this move to data mesh. Right. And so I mentioned that data mesh um, is, uh, has four key principles. So let's just have a like consider these four key principles quickly. Um, and so number one is this sort of like domain driven decentralization. And, and really this is the, the, the heart of it. Now, many of us will be familiar with the move from the application monolith to microservices. Um, and that's a very sort of like a, a very useful analogy for the move from the data monolith, the data warehouse uh, that was run by a central team to data that is actually, um, it is built out of a specific domain. And actually, that just reminded me one thing that um, I didn't point out um, up in this, up in this uh, overview is this piece was done by some data team. And this data team typically was organizational wide. And so their responsibility was for all of the data being produced by all of the systems in all of the domains across the company. And their job was to actually understand to make sense of that data and then um, do something with it that made it more useful. And so what we start to lack is an idea of context. So data is built in a context and, and, and quite often uh, that context is a business domain. And so if we, if we look down to these kind of like principles, this domain driven decentralization is this kind of like move to move data in the same way we moved applications so that the, the teams that are responsible for building the systems that actually um, gather, collect, and create the data actually have control of that data. And so really this comes down to kind of like ownership. So at the, at the very offset, what we're solving by this is saying that these teams actually own this data. It is their responsibility. Um, and, and that reduces a lot of confusion. Now, one of, the, one of the real benefits of this is that the team have an awareness of the context in which the data was created, um, which is something that kind of like at that, um, at, when you're doing a big data team across an organization, that context quite often goes missing. The other, the next principle, um, which I think actually is one of the most useful principles here, even though maybe not the most important, certainly the most useful, is this move uh, to data as a first class product. And so in the past, we might have thought of data as an asset. And certainly the data lake encourages that because 
With an asset, the tendency is to actually collect as much of it as possible, quite often to protect it, but not question necessarily how it's going to be useful. It's a bit similar to hoarding, really. Um, and so this sort of led to this collection of data that wasn't being used, wasn't well understood, and wasn't delivering value. And so when we actually shift from thinking of the data that's created in our domain, um, and we start to think of that as actually not an asset, but a product, our thinking changes very, very quickly. Because a product, first of all, a product has customers. There are people who want to use a product. So suddenly, we're starting to think about, well, what are the needs of the customer? So who's going to be using this data? What, what, do they, uh, what format is going to suit them? How are they going to find this data? Um, and, and, and various other things about how you productize data. And that, that shift in mindset is really useful for designing what data is going to be shared across the organization. And remember, this domain-driven team is still responsible for this data as a product. Um, as we move across to uh, this idea of a self-serve data platform, this is all about, all about making, um, reducing the kind of like the, the, the bottlenecks and reducing the friction of actually using data across the organization. And then finally, federated governance uh, is still important. So we've moved from this, this centralized team to these decentralized teams based on domains to produce data. But in order to have that data shared across the organization in a reliable way, we need to be able to trust in that data, in the data quality, uh, in where we're going to find that data, in the data timeliness, et cetera. And so these principles uh, basically lead to um, a number of benefits. So the business benefits um, of a well-realized data mesh, first of all, let's not underestimate the fact that the data now has an owner. Somebody is responsible for the owner. Uh, for the data. Um, also, that um, this data um, can actually start to scale within the organization. We remove that bottleneck of a data team who are trying to make sense of other teams' data, spending most of their days cleaning up and preparing data that they don't have the full context for, and then trying to produce reports for, again, maybe not even realizing how those reports were going to be used. So. By, by, by actually um, moving that data ownership to the domain, we increase the ability to scale the use of this data within the organization. Um, also, by making that data discoverable at that federated level, this concept of organization-wide data products um, encourages use. Um, we also, because the, the team who is responsible for creating the data is, is actually controlling the quality and the reliability of the data, uh, we see an increase in that quality and reliability. And finally, really, um, this is uh, one of the most profound um, changes of sharing data across an organization, is this ability to encourage innovation and agility within the organization. And that's something which is vital to modern businesses as they compete uh, with startups, disruptors, et cetera, uh, the ability to actually build products based on data um, can't be underestimated. So these are the kind of like the benefits of uh, data mesh. Now, if you want sort of like more detail about data mesh, I, I have I've done this service the way I've covered it very quickly. Um, there are some great resources uh, from ThoughtWorks, particularly around the concept. And there's a lot of talk about it uh, um, yeah, uh, in the usual places. but. Moving down, the, like the, the second piece was to actually talk about um, the event streaming platform. And the event streaming platform, the role of that, or, or what, the, what a, an event streaming platform does, is it gives you the ability to process events in real time, at scale, and in a durable way. Now, an event is any kind of like bit of business information, a business fact, if you like. It's created, it's immutable. Events are created in businesses all of the time, whether we know it or not. Um, so these events in a manufacturing context might be um, some kind of IoT device on a production line. They might be the um, telemetry from a delivery truck um, or an Uber Eats, uh, more topically. 
um, or just as topically. Um, or they may be clickstream data from customers interacting with your brand, your website, your mobile application. But often the first uh, source of these events are actually in these databases, these passive data stores um, that capture the state of your business. Now, the when we start sharing events across an organization, we need to be sure that the data quality can be ensured. And that's where we actually talk about sort of like this schema management um, and the ability to actually control um, the, the shape of the data that is shared so that when I subscribe to, um, to a, a, a domain's data, I'm getting exactly what I expected because I actually need to know that so that I can build applications on top of it. Um, finally, uh, well, not finally, sorry, uh, we also need a way of connecting the event streaming platform to all of these different data silos and systems in use across the organization. Um, we would like the ability to actually modify that data in real time as it flowed through the system. This is kind of like the real time streaming ETL. So we're changing the shape of that data, we're possibly enriching that data. Um, and finally, we'd like the ability to be able to store these events. So very quickly and being uh, very mindful of, uh, of time, um, let's have a look at how we sort of like typically will build out this system. So let's just take this application, this mysterious application. It could be a, a monolith, it could be a microservice. That doesn't matter too much, but typically this application is gonna have some kind of data store. And so it's gonna be reading and, uh, and writing to that data store. This will be a system of record for the application. Now, the first step in actually creating a data mesh is to be able to share this information, to unlock the information from this database. And so if we take an event streaming lens, the way we would do that is via uh, what we call a connector. So we would have a connector that runs here. And these are all provided by a framework called, um, called the Connect framework. So the Connect framework is a way of, uh, of running uh, connectors, which are basically pre-built plugins that know about a particular type of system. So in this case, it knows about this database. Let's just say it's an Oracle database. And so it's capturing the data as it changes in Oracle. Now, the next bit is, well, when those changes happen, what do we do with them? And that's where we introduce uh, this uh, funny sort of like tube structure, which actually is meant to represent uh, Kafka. So this is Kafka. And every time there's a state mutation in this data store, so every time the app updates its data store, uh, this is captured as a stream of events. So this purple line represents a stream of events, uh, and those events are changes in the database. And we actually build up a number of these event streams. Now, um, as these streams are being created, there's a downstream part to this story, okay? So that's, the, that's kind of like the upstream, the source of the data, but typically, will want to be capturing, will doing something with this data. And so the use case that is top of mind at the moment is this data warehouse. And so we have the data, we have the uh, data warehouse, I can get the right pen. Uh, we have the data warehouse uh, sitting down here. Um, and so this is actually a subscriber to this system, to Kafka. And it does that again, using the same pattern of connectors, right? So we, uh, we, initiate a connector, which is basically just configuration. Um, and it will tell Kafka to, well, it will grab from Kafka the relevant events and it will push them down into the data warehouse. And so when we sort of like step back a little bit, um, you'll look at this and you'll say, okay, I, I get this. This is PubSub. And when we do PubSub in our company, we use a message queue. Um, Kafka and event streaming has kind of like significant advantages over a message queue. Um, the first kind of like ones, first of all, uh, we'll talk about scale. So Kafka can scale to an incredible level. So we've got uh, Kafka implementations that are processing in excess of 10 trillion events per day. That's 112 million events per second. So they're working at a scale that message queues probably aren't going to work at. Um, but the other thing is this notion of durability. So Kafka treats uh, messages kind of in a durable way. When we write something, we don't want it lost. So it writes it across three different locations, three different servers. These can be three different availability zones. So the PubSub is important, um, but 
just as important to this is this notion of storage. And so when we look at these topics, in a message queue, that may be ephemeral. It may be disappear after one day, seven days, whatever. In Kafka, that, that may be retained for one day. It may be retained for seven days. But it might also be retained for 30 days or, or even infinitely. Right, and infinite retention introduces this really interesting idea with Kafka, uh, and it's an idea that many are uncomfortable with, probably because it's quite a new idea. But this idea of Kafka as a source of truth across the organization. So, if Kafka is the source of truth, well, then what's the data warehouse? Because the data warehouse typically is where we put all of our data. Well, in this model. Um, the data warehouse is just another index of data, which is particularly optimized for a particular use case. So let's just, and I don't want to sort of like uh, underplay the importance of uh, a data warehouse, but let's just say it's an analytics use case. But this data upstream, I may also want to be able to search for this across the organization, right? And the data warehouse may not be the I ideal way for a real time search. And so using this, this model, and because all of these events exist, I can very easily add a new system. And this system will follow the same pattern. So we introduce it via a connector. And that connector may hydrate an elastic search instance, which is optimized for search. So it's, it's great for driving this federated search. And I also, so, so this is kind of like a search use case. And elastic search is an index of this data, this source of truth that's particularly optimized for search in the same way that a data warehouse is optimized for uh, analytics. Um, and so then we add additional use cases. So let's just say we have an archival use case, and this might be S3, same pattern. We install the connector, the connector grabs the data uh, and pushes it to S3. Now, with this, with this pattern, we can start to, oh, I haven't written storage in here as being important. <laughs> with this pattern, we can add new upstream sources. So other applications follow exactly the same pattern where we install a connector, that connector unlocks those events from that state store, pushes them into event streaming. But an interesting thing happens, which is whenever there is a change to a piece of data in one of these upstream systems, the connector picks it up in real time or near real time, depending on what definition you want to use. It pushes it into the event stream. And then any connector that is subscribing to that event stream will actually grab that data in real time. So this is why we talk about data in motion, because it's this idea that data changes and it flows throughout the organization. Um, and then the final thing here is in terms of uh, stream processing, the ability to actually do the ETL uh, in real time. And so this is a stream processor is essentially an application that will uh, listen to event streams and create new event streams with modified data or processed data. So this may be enrichment, filtering, uh, whatever you like, but that's kind of like the, the, the general model of stream processing. So. In this model, um, you can see where Kafka sits and how it actually uh, works with kind of like these upstream uh, data, data sources. Um, the advantages of this model, the benefits, and I, I'm very mindful of time now, so I'm going to speed it up a little bit, uh, is this ability to uh, integrate once. So you just saw in that pattern, integration becomes kind of far less of an issue because we're not integrating point to point. Uh, scalability and durability is a given the real-time updates, uh, the data in motion. And I will just quickly draw up um, a couple of uh, graphs. Um, the first one is for big data. And it's, it's about extracting value from big data, value there. And we look at the amount of data, and we actually see that sort of like the value, the business value of that data tends to increase as the amount of data increases. With fast data, this is very different. We still have value on the left-hand axis, uh, but on the right-hand axis, we have time. And the curve does something interesting. Uh, it's not as shaky as that, that's just <laughs> my handwriting. Uh, it's very smooth. Um, the, the value actually decays quickly over time. So what does that mean? Why would that be? Well, let's think about the uh, fraud use case. So in the past, banks would analyze transactions and, and, and actually create 
um, uh, create batch reports overnight. And that report would essentially say how much money you lost the day before due to fraud. And so the when we look at this as fast data, um, the, the, the transaction will be analyzed in real time and the actual uh, transaction will be denied. So you never actually allow the transaction through. So that's a very useful uh, and real world uh, comparison between the value of big data and fast data. Really aware of time now. Um, so data mesh and um, meet event streaming. So how does Kafka kind of like help us implement uh, the data mesh? Um, and the, uh, the, the actual um, answer is, if we, if we think about that diagram, but instead of like the diagram that we just drew here, but instead of thinking about systems, um, we think about um, we think about domains, right? So here we may have um, we may have a domain, a business domain, and we we might sort of like have a a number of these business domains. So they'll be here, and we would have kind of like in this system, we would have Kafka sitting here. These business domains will actually be re using um, Kafka in two ways. Um, first of all. Um, they will be creating uh, streams of events, uh, typically using what we would call uh, event-driven microservices. And so they would have their own kind of like internal domain-specific topics uh, to exchange data, to work with data with the freedom that uh, you get from a domain-specific language. And then they would actually share that data. Once it had been prepared and packaged up as a product, they would then share that data across the organization uh, using what we might consider kind of like global or product topics. And those global topics using access rules, et cetera, uh, would be available for all other domains so that now they have access to this productized data. Now, moving to the five things that, I work for Confluent, five features that Confluent do really well that help this work. First is the Connect framework. So the first step to having to setting this up is to actually enable connection to data stores. And we've got a, a availability of over 200 connectors for, for a lot of well-known and not so well-known systems. Um, infinite storage, the ability to actually store events um, that aren't bound by mounted disks. So we have very elegant systems for actually storing this data. Stream governance. We just had a big release overnight, actually, and I encourage you to look because it's very relevant. Um, we, we had a big release to our governance products so that you can not only control the schema of data, but we actually have a data catalog so that you can find different, um, different types of data within the, within the system. Um, and this also gives you visibility into data lineage. Um, and then KSQL DB, which is a, a stream processor, this is a hosted way of actually building these real-time streaming ETL pipelines just using SQL code uh, in, a, in an easy-to-use CLI interface or RESTful API. And then finally, cluster linking, uh, which allows, like, unlocks a huge number of possibilities of moving data between Kafka clusters, so further devolving ownership um, where a domain may own its own cluster, but then it shares a, a, the sort of productized topic with other clusters in, a, in order to have sort of like the data as a product. Um, I did have some uh, little images here of kind of like these ideas of kind of like this data lineage so we can track data through the system. Um, and also this notion of a data catalog, uh, which introduces some interesting things like being able to tag data as PII and automatically anonymize or, or redact that data. Now, I think I'm at time, um, unless I've got that all completely wrong. I have one minute. Um, so uh, I might throw back to you, David. Uh, I, I don't know if I've left much time for questions, um, but no, that's great. Thank you very much, James. Um, that was fantastic and a great overview of, of data mesh. Um, I, there's not a lot of time for questions, unfortunately, but, but what, what I'd like to ask you is how, how can other people get in touch with you? 
um, if they want to find out a bit more. Yeah, sure. So I, I think I've shared my LinkedIn profile on the platform. Um, I've, I've got it there. I'm hoping to be able to share this sort of like this overall whiteboard as a JPEG. Um, so yep. that's my LinkedIn uh, profile um, or um, jgolan at confluent.io. Excellent. Thanks very much, James. And, my pleasure. Um, look forward to seeing what the what was released overnight. Yeah, yeah, it's it's worth watching. Actually, it's worth watching. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much.